I think of a story of these hawksbill sea turtles off the coast of Barbados that are actually hatched in the sand, typically when there's a full moon. God has sort of hardwired them to look for light. And because the light of the moon reflects off the sea, they start naturally making their way towards the sea, to their home, to the place where they belong. The problem is that 80% of these sea turtles never make it to the sea. And the reason is, on the other side of the beach, there's actually a town that's been built up. Instead of going towards the light of the ocean, following the natural light of the moon, they actually head towards this artificial man-made light that competes with the natural light of the moon. And you know what happens. It reminded me of Proverbs 16, 25, which says, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. Jesus came into this world to show us the way and to lead us into the kingdom of God. Hello, Shelter Rock Church, Pastor Steve here. And we have this little dwelling that we keep in our closet in Syosset. It has beams like this. In fact, these are two of the beams from it. And it makes a little shelter. Now, we often use it at Christmas time because it looks like a nativity, someplace you could have Mary and Joseph and the baby. I was looking at how complex it would be to actually put this thing together, and I can tell you it, it is above my pay grade because I'm not very good at this. But I tell you, it reminds me of something that is very important for this time of year. And those of you from a Jewish tradition will understand this immediately. Those from a Christian perspective, probably not so much. But Sunday, October 9, this Sunday, is the beginning of Sukkot. Now, what is Sukkot? It literally means the Feast of Booths, or sometimes called the Feast of Tabernacles. It lasts for seven days. And if you drive around different parts of Brooklyn, different parts of Great Neck, you will see all around these little huts in the back of people's houses, on the side of their house, on the roof of their house, all different places because it is something to commemorate when the people of Israel had to live in booths to commemorate their time in the wilderness. And it's so appropriate that today's message corresponds with that Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths or Sukkot. And it's appropriate for a number of reasons. The reason why God ordained this, recorded in Leviticus chapter 23, is that he wanted the people to remember for all time that there was a time when they lived in the wilderness and they lived in portable shelters. And so up to this day, those who are practicing Jewish community, particularly in the more orthodox tradition, they will minimally eat their meals in their booth in their backyard, or they'll even sleep there. And that was the idea, just to have a time in their lives to say, hey, our people had to survive 40 years in the wilderness and we lived in huts like this. What we're wanting to do right now is to con continue our journey, the way of the kingdom. And today we're gonna continue it by looking at the way of encounter, specifically encountering God's word. Now, as Christians, we probably have an understanding that the Bible is part of our journey of being a Christian. Reading the Bible, having sermons preached from the Bible, having the Bible taught to our children. But I'm not sure all of us encounter the Bible in all of its richness and wonder that could really be transformational in your life. If you and I are gonna follow the way of the kingdom, what needs to be a priority in our life is having an encounter with the Word of God, what we call the Bible. Now, just recognizing that all of us need to prepare our hearts and to get ready to hear from the Lord, would you bow your heads with me as we pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us? 
Father, it is our great privilege once again to spend a few minutes just loving you by the study of your word. Father, we have so many things that distract us in our lives, but for the next few minutes, would you help us by your Holy Spirit to receive everything we need? And if anything I say, Lord, is not helpful or doesn't contribute to this goal, I pray it would fall away and that the end result is that we would be a people discovering to love, in particular, your son Jesus even more because it is his word, your word, that tells us all about him. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you have a Bible with you, would you open it now to the Gospel of Matthew? It's the first book in the New Testament. Gospel of Matthew, we're gonna look at chapter four and we're going to read the first few verses of that Gospel. So again, Matthew chapter four, and we're gonna start in verse one and take it to verse four. Here's what we read. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Great passage, and this is what's gonna carry us on our journey. And here's what I want us to do. I wanna look at having an encounter with biblical history, having an encounter with the power of God, and having an encounter with Jesus. Now with that in mind, we have to give a little background of our passage. Our passage is one in which Jesus is in the wilderness and he's going to be tempted by the devil. Now, right before this, Jesus is baptized. The, all the presence of the Trinity is there. The Son is being baptized. The Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove and the voice of God is heard, this is my Son. Now, Jesus immediately feels compelled to go into a wilderness area He's there for 40 days, 40 nights. He is fasting. He is not eaten. He's hungry. And it is in that place of weakness. He is fully human. He is not using all his divine attributes. And so he is in a place, we could say, of weakness. But it is in that time, in that weakness, that Satan comes, the devil comes, to tempt him. And the first temptation is relating to food, sustenance to which Jesus responds saying, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, the first point that I wanna unfold as we look at this passage is this. We need an encounter with biblical history. You and I, we need an encounter with biblical history. You know, on a given Sunday, many of us parents take our kids to church and they go to a Sunday school class, and then on the car drive home, many of us as parents will ask our children, what did you learn today? And what we often hear are the various stories. Oh, I, I learned about Jonah. I learned about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. I learned about King David taking on Goliath. All these wonderful stories. The truth is, you and I should have the same hunger for these biblical narratives of history so that we can learn and grow and have an encounter with how God did things previously. So when we look at this passage, Matthew chapter four, verse one to four, and we hear this quote of Jesus, you know what it turns out? He is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse three. In other words, this phrase that Jesus says, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that, that emanates from the mouth of God comes from the Torah. And what we need to do is to look back to get a little more context of what Jesus is doing in this passage. And so if you want to look in your own Bible, feel free. The verses are, again, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and the first three verses. Here's what we read. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today. 
so that it, you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and to test you in order for you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, get this, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, to appreciate the context of what is taking place here, this is Moses giving a sermon to the people before they enter the promised land. And chapter eight of Deuteronomy is very important in that sermon. Because here's what Moses knows. He's not going into the promised land, but there are certain truths that they must remember. He realizes when they go to the promised land and fulfill the scriptures, they're gonna be successful. They're gonna plant crops, they're gonna grow. They're gonna raise animals, they're gonna reproduce, and they're gonna end up having lovely homes and beautiful families, and eventually people might say, I did this, I brought this wealth on myself. But here is where Moses says, remember the Lord, remember the things you learned in the wilderness. Now it is at this context that Moses says that God brought them in the wilderness causing them to hunger so that he could feed them with manna and that the people would realize man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. This is a biblical narrative that Jesus uses to shut down Satan. See, one of the most effective things that Satan does for you, and to me, is to make us feel that we are self-sufficient, that we don't need anything really from God. I have my bank account, I have a pretty good job, I'm good, I'm squared away. But Jesus says, as he's hungry, 40 days, nights and days, no eating. Do you get the parallelism? 40 years in the wilderness, Jesus 40 days in the wilderness. But when Satan comes, he actually quotes this lesson. Paul says these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, these Old Testament passages were written for us as examples so that we can learn. And what we find is that Jesus is somebody who paid attention to these stories and now uses them against the enemy. And what is the primary lesson in this particular story? It is that we are not to rely on ourselves. We are to rely on the Lord. Do we need to eat? Of course we need to eat. Man does not live only by bread. It's not that we don't need bread, we do need bread. But also on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And, and what is that? That's your Bible. And so this book contains so many historical examples of how God interacts with his people. And when you feed on them, just like Jesus did, you have an encounter with God. Regularly, I find myself so blessed because I read the scriptures and I'm investigating them and digging deep. Some of you may know I teach a Bible class at the church. I'm going through the book of Jeremiah. I teach it in Manhattan on Monday nights, I teach it in Syosset on Wednesday nights, and we go verse by verse exposition. It's even on uh, the internet. By all means, tune in if you like. But one of the things that I learn from studying the book of Jeremiah is that I can talk to God honestly. I, I learned that from historical narrative found in the book of Jeremiah. Do you realize that you can tell God all the things that are going on in your heart and mind, you can. The truth is, you know he knows them already. So why not just be honest? And so I was reading through Jeremiah chapter 20, starting at verse seven, and I paraphrase this. Oh Lord, Jeremiah says, you deceived me 
and I was deceived. All day long, all you give me to preach is doom and destruction, and I've had it up to here. But Jeremiah goes on to say, but if I say I will not mention you, or speak any more in your name. Your word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up on my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I look at that passage and I see, wow, that's powerful. I can tell God what's really on my heart. Sometimes I feel alone and I wonder, does God even see me? And I, and I read Psalm 139. David writes, where can I go from your presence? Where can I hide from your spirit? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. He, he goes on to say, every day of my life is written in your book before any of them have come to be. And when I wake up, you're still there. I read these words from David as he expresses his own emotion. And you know what I know? God is with me. He knows me. He knows what I'm going through. And how do I know this? I'm becoming familiar with biblical history. You see, exactly what your kids are doing, you need also. You need to know these stories so that you can grow and, and become stronger in your own faith. You know what's bugging me these days? I'll tell you, and I'm embarrassed by it. It's the Wall Street market. I now, because of my mother's resources, I look at the market and I know where our investments are. And, and just the other day, uh, last week, I, I look at the market and, I, and I'm in shock. I, I said to my wife, Michelle, we've lost $7,000 in one day. And, and, and as I'm getting closer to retirement, I, I look at this money, I have anxiety. And then I remember these words of Jesus. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then I look where that's found, Deuteronomy 8, and I find out that God sometimes places us in situations where we actually are hungry so that we depend on him and not on our bank accounts and not on literal food. This I gain from biblical history. So, first thing I want to encounter with is the biblical historical story of scripture. The second thing is I want an encounter with the power of God. I mean, doesn't that sound great? Now, in our story in Matthew chapter four, Jesus is taking on none other than Satan, the one who is the author of evil. And what does he do every time he takes him on? He quotes scripture. First time, it's Deuteronomy 8. Second time, he's going to quote Deuteronomy 6. The third time, he's going to quote Deuteronomy 6. What Jesus realizes, is something that often we do not realize, is that God's word is powerful. I mean, there is a dynamic there that can carry us through wherever we are hurting, wherever we find ourselves in need. Let me give you a, a few scriptures that reinforce this. The first one I want to give you is from Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 11, I read this. My word that goes out of my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So in other words, God's word, the scripture, is never going to be void of power. It's always going to be there. And this is a truth that is picked up in the New Testament also. Let me give you an example of what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. He writes this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. This is the Bible. It is filled with power. Do you avail yourself of this power? Because it is there for you. Frequently, I get different issues in my life that cause me some anxiety. I'm no different. Just because I'm a pastor, I have anxiety. So if you're looking at this picture in detail, you may say, hey, what's going on with Pastor Steve's eye over here? Might see a little shadowy area. Well, you know what that is? I had a little surgery last Wednesday, one week ago. 
it was a, a bump there, probably filled with some fatty tissue or something, but it was right near my eye and it was causing some issues. So I, I go into the dermatologist to have it removed. Now, how about you? When somebody is using very sharp implements, two centimeters away from one of my eyeballs, I don't find it encouraging, hopeful, upbeat. I was a little anxious. And as I go into the office, you know what I'm quoting to myself? Isaiah 26, verse three. I will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is steadfast on me. You know what that is for me? It's the power of God. It's enabling me to do what I don't necessarily feel I have the strength to do. You know, I've been preaching quite some time now. In fact, I just found the first sermon I ever delivered at age 23. I'm actually changing it from a cassette tape to a digital format even now. And it was fun to listen to it. But to this day, when I'm gonna get up to preach, I still have anxiety, because I don't wanna mess it up. I'm having the privilege to speak representing the Lord, and I wanna honor him well. But you know what a verse that the Lord has given me this summer, and I say it every time I get up to preach, for this summer. In other words, it's kind of a fresh verse for me. It's from Micah, chapter three, verse eight. Here's what the prophet says. Now, he was nervous himself, and this is what he says. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord, with justice, and with might. I love that verse. In fact, when I was at VBS and teaching the kids, I had all the students at VBS memorize this verse. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and with might. And you know what, when I have this verse inside me, I'm ready to get on that stage. I'm ready to preach because I know it's not about me. It is about the power that God has given me, the Spirit of God that he's given me, and what I'm finding that this book is endued with power and I want to use it. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we preach Christ crucified to the Jew a stumbling block, to the Greek foolishness, but to we who are being saved, it is the very power of God. The gospel, which comes from this book, is endued with power from God. So here's an assignment for you. You need to learn the scripture. Oh, Pastor Steve, you memorize scripture. You're a pastor. That's what they pay you to do. Well, you know, all of us can memorize the scripture. You know, in the Jewish tradition, in early years, it was incumbent upon every male child to memorize, get this, memorize the first five books of the Bible by age 13. And if you were good at it, you'd take the rest of the Tanakh or the Hebrew scriptures and finish that by age 18. One of the ways in the Middle Ages the rabbis inspired the kids to want to learn the scripture is their first day of Hebrew school, when they're gonna start learning the Torah, the rabbi would take a little bit of honey and put it on the scroll and have the child lick it off so that the child would have an impression in their mind of the sweetness of the word of God. What I wanna challenge you is start memorizing some scriptures. And you go, oh, Pastor Steve, I, I can't do that. My mind doesn't work that way. You know, it's not that hard. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Do you think you know it? Okay, you got it. You got a verse memorized. Good for you. But you know what memorization is all about? It's just a few words at a time over a series of days. And before you know it, you know an entire verse. So here's something that we're putting together for you, us, as a church. I asked each of the pastors to give us their favorite verse. And so here are five cards that contain 10 verses. Now I'm gonna be handing this out Sunday morning at our Manhasset campus. But you who are watching online, you have the opportunity to have these five cards, 10 verses mailed to you also, here's all you do. Just send an email to info at shelterrockchurch.com, info at shelterrockchurch.com, put in the address and just say scripture verses, and then when in the letter, give us your address. 
and we will mail you these verses because we don't want you to miss out on having the opportunity. Now, what are you going to do with these verses? Number one, it's fascinating to hear what each of the pastors put as one of their favorite verses. But secondly, you're being loaded up with the power of God that can strengthen you as you move forward in your life. Now, here's another thing. For those of you particularly who don't feel like you're good at memorizing, do you have the YouVersion app on your phone? Because if you don't, just go to your phone right now and go to your apps and type in YouVersion. And I'll show you what it's going to look like. It's going to look like this. You can see a little picture of a Bible. And this has like virtually every translation that you can imagine. You can type in questions like, what do I do when I feel certain ways? You can just look up passages. It is so helpful. And here's another cool feature. You can actually have the scripture read to you by this. So you're commuting on the Long Island Railroad. You can have the scripture going through your ears as you're on your journey into New York City or wherever you're going. Why am I encouraging this? Because there's power here. We have the joy of the encounter of biblical history, learning from the stories of the past. Secondly, we have the encounter of God's power, which is endued in these words. But finally, we have an encounter with none other than Jesus. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. You know, Jesus says in Luke chapter 24, that he's reading with the guys on the Emmaus Road. Remember that? Two disciples? This is after Jesus is raised from the dead and they don't quite recognize who Jesus is. But then they sit down and have a Bible study. And here's what the text says. Beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus explained to them all the passages in the Hebrew Bible that were about him. And I moved to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 7, and Jesus is speaking again, and, and here's what he says. Of the volume of the book, of the scroll that we have, it is about me. And so every time I am reading the Bible, you know what I look forward to? Is an encounter with Jesus because I want to know Jesus. I want to know everything there is about him. And I can discover things about Jesus from the Hebrew scriptures. I can discover things about Jesus from the gospels, from, from Paul's letters, from the, from the book of Acts, from the book of Revelation. And before you know it, I am finding that my own life, my own hope, my own confidence is going higher because I'm discovering who Jesus is. And I want to know more about who he is. You know, there was a theologian by the name of Karl Barth, German theologian. He was part of a very liberal theological community. And what I mean by liberal theological community, a community that I would even call post-Christian. The Bible is more of a historical book. We hear some interesting things that pertain to people who believe this stuff way back when. But you know what? It really doesn't communicate anything from God. But Karl Barth coming out of that tradition, he said, you know what? No, the Bible does indeed tell us about God. And in particular, it tells us about Jesus. So near the end of Bart's life, he was on a speaking tour and he was at the University of Chicago. The year was 1962. And there was a time for questions and answers. And a student raises his hand. And says, Dr. Bart, you've written many books, of which we have read many of them. Could you summarize everything you've learned studying the Bible and writing about it from a theological perspective? And Dr. Bart said, yes, I believe I can. And everyone is like leaning forward. What is the famous Dr. Bart going to say that he has learned after all his years? He said, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now, if you know of Karl Barth's theology, that statement was so profound because that was what he was arguing, that in the Bible, we have the blessing of hearing from God. What do we observe from Jesus and his interaction with Satan in Matthew chapter 4? 
When he takes on Satan, he is armed with scripture. When we look back at what Jesus is quoting from, we see the power of biblical history and how we can gain. So even though the markets are going like this or my relationships are going like this, I have an anchor that I can hold on to. It's how God interacted with the people of God in days gone by. And then I realized that the very word itself, the Bible, is so filled with power. And to use the analogy of the rabbis, it is sweet. The psalmist says, sweeter than the honeycomb. And then it is an opportunity for you and I to encounter Jesus. And quite honestly, there is nothing better for you and I to pursue. It's actually with a lot of joy that I have this topic to tell you that we need to pursue a relationship with God's word, encounter God's word. Because I can tell you from personal experience, it is what holds me together. My life is different than yours. Your life is different than mine. But one thing we can share in common of building our life on the strong foundation of God's word. Discover it afresh. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, in every home that I'm speaking to, I bet there's a Bible. Probably in most of the homes, there are multiple Bibles on shelves, covered in dust. And we can say, oh yeah, I have the Bible on my phone, but do we use it? Do we read it? Father, what we have in our homes, indeed in our hands, is the very power of God. It is not the book, it is that the book points us to you and your words are filled with power. These stories are filled with lessons, examples that we can learn from. So I'm praying that we as a congregation, as we press on even in this message series, will crave more and more to discover your word, who you are, and enjoy that power flowing through us, manifest through your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and have a great day.